Welcome all of you. Today uh, is the third session called Discover Manual of Life. So in the last two sessions, uh, specifically the first session, we discussed about soul. The soul is the real self. This body is like a uh, like a dress. Just like uh, we have specific, you know, the, the dress has specific shape because the body has specific shape. So similarly, uh, the body is like a dress for the soul. The real self is Atman. And, uh, you know, we are like the driver. The self is the driver. Uh, we learned about, you know, a little more de in depth uh, about the concept of soul. Uh, similarly, just like the soul lightens up the body or uh, makes up the, you know, the personality of the body. Uh, for this whole cosmos, there is, you know, we discussed about the concept of God, who lightens up the universe of the existence. Uh, so, so he's the, the God is the driver for the uh, cosmos, the existence that we see around. So with this, um, just like when, uh, you know, just like the driver needs a manual to operate this mission called body, you know, uh, any anything in our life we take you know we need a manual to operate properly right you buy a cooker for example you know that you know uh, you need to switch it off at say third whistle or fourth whistle if you don't you know you may spoil the kitchen right so similarly we need a manual for our life if the body is a mission or this cosmos is a mission it is operating under certain conditions so we need to understand to live in harmony in this existence or to live in harmony with yourself, you need a manual. The manual, that manual is the Vedic wisdom or specifically Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita is like a life manual. It teaches how to lead a very meaningful and purposeful life in this existence. Um, how to live in harmony uh, with you know people, things, everything around us. Right? Uh, through ups and downs, how to lead, you know, uh, without being disturbed, uh, how to lead, you know, a purposeful life. So we learn about, uh, you know, that manual of life, uh, right? But this manual of life is not knowledge that was coming from human like us. It's It has an origin that is beyond uh, human intellect, right? It's actually given by God, but how do we trust, you know, in such ideas, whether it is really coming from God? So we'll understand a little more about, in general, how do we acquire knowledge in this world? And how do we actually uh, understand, you know, what is perfect knowledge, right? So we'll understand those concepts today. Yeah, first, before that, to because we are talking about Vedic knowledge, how do we really believe Vedic knowledge is great or Vedic knowledge is perfect? So in Vedas, there is description of chara and achara much long before, like thousands of years ago itself in the Vedic wisdom. Like chara means, you know, the moving living entities. Achara means non-moving. For example, plants are, you know, plants do not move, right? Plants are in one place. Until recently, until say 100 years ago, the modern you know world or the modern science believed that plants have no life. Yeah. So until Jagadish Chandra Bose, you know, a, an Indian scientist who proved that plants have life. Right. Uh, but this fact was given in Vedas much long before, thousands of years ago. So we can see that you know Vedic aphorisms stood the test of time, mm -hmm. and in fact. You know, we could prove, you know, with modern science that these these are actually facts. Right? So this is this is one fact. The embryology is how the child goes, you know, grows from the day one, from the time the sperm and you know egg unite. Right. So that when did modern science come to know about it? It's only like maybe 50, 60 years ago when you know the ultrasound came into existence. Uh, so now with ultrasounds, uh, you know, discovery, 
modern world come to know exactly how the embryo grows from you know uh, the the size of you know the pea to to the emulsification and the whole month by month growth but the exact description of how the this embryo develops from day one since the time the sperm and the egg unite so that is given in scriptures like bhagavatam in third canto very clearly describes exactly how from day one what is the progress when the hands form when the mind develops so all those you know how the moments of the fetus will be all those are given in vedic scriptures which are at least thousands of years ago right so they if you think about it they don't have access to modern uh, you know uh, modern science or ultrasound or anything so how did they even discover the you know moments of uh, you know the baby in the womb from day one when they don't have any of these instruments so there is a higher science there is a different ways to know these you know the truths of this existence so embryology is one example and cow dung especially in the you know in the villages even today they use cow dung mixed with water as you know antiseptic they pour it before their you know their homes to keep away from bees mosquitoes and other uh, you know insects um, so it's antiseptic and it is a well known thing from thousands of years in india they use that when did modern science figure that actually cow dung is uh, antiseptic that's only like you know 40 50 years ago uh, but india modern you know the uh, sanatan dharma or vedic uh, wisdom you know already propounds that this you know cow dung is actually uh, antiseptic and it has a lot of good qualities if you look at any other you know uh, waste or you know uh, excreta is no other excreta has such properties only cow's excreta has that properties it's unique and this truth is known to us you know vedic science knows this fact long long time ago so these are some of the facts uh, you know even yoga right yoga you know modern world you know in the west the focus is on you know uh, gym how to develop your physical fitness but uh, in the in the vedic india the the focus to keep your health is through practice of yoga and we all know very well even in the west now yoga is more popular than gyms uh, everywhere people you know practice yoga and asanas to keep their body fit so this is a known thing for many many thousands of years ago right uh, in the vedic india and today uh, astrology you know astrology is a science you know people can predict very well how you know things will unfold if people know the science uh, so there is organic farming sanskrit so these are all you know vedic truths which have stood the test of time hmm? these are some of the examples in the in the past there was no you know research or anything these were accepted as truth because they are given in vedas right so that's why people sometimes used to say oh why are you saying that are you vedic authority something like that right so people say like that because vedic authority is taken is axiomatic truth means it's um, you know it's unquestionable facts right now we'll understand you know to gain faith in vedic wisdom we'll understand where exactly vedic wisdom really fits in in this overall scope of gaining knowledge in this existence right so let's uh, so there are there is a there is a story we'll learn now uh, six blind men and one wise man uh, and then so these are the topics we'll cover three ways of gaining knowledge four defects and uh, you know uh, scientific research as well on this screen. so you see here there is an elephant and uh, there are six blind men so the first man so each of them are blind so they don't know what that is so they're trying to figure out what that is 
closed their, their eyes or all blind. So, so somebody caught the trunk and uh, he felt it is a snake, right? So it looks like snake. Maybe, you know, elephant is like a snake, he said. The second man, he caught the tail. He said, this must be a rope. Elephant is like a rope, is his statement. So third man caught the ear. So he felt, you know, this is so sharp. Maybe it's a dagger. He felt it's a dagger, right? So the fifth man held um, the, the tusks. So he felt maybe this is uh, some, you know, dagger you know, uh, or a sharp arrow, right? Mm -hmm. So he felt it is a sharp arrow. Sixth man touched the stomach. So he said elephant is a wall, right? And uh, seventh man held the, the leg and he felt this is a trunk, tree trunk. So in this way, everybody had their own understanding of what the truth is about the elephant. Uh, now, so are they correct, each of these people? Are they correct in what they have understood from, from their own experience? Yeah, exactly. So they are perceiving this existence through what they can perceive. And they are correct to the extent they can perceive, right? So they're all correct. Yeah. So now, but is that the perfect understanding of, yeah, it's not complete. It's, it's correct in the sense of what they perceived, but it's not the perfect understanding of the object that is existing there. So when we try to acquire knowledge through various means in this world, through our senses, so he used his senses, the sense of touch. That's how the blind men tried to acquire knowledge. So they were acquiring so and so knowledge. It's imperfect. Uh, but how do we acquire perfect knowledge in this world? So that is the question that will be answered towards the end of. This. So we'll go through some more examples on how perception in, in this world is only going to give us imperfect knowledge or partial knowledge. Yeah. So here, uh, broadly speaking, to gain, to one, when we want to gain knowledge, there are three methods to acquire knowledge, right? One is Pratyaksha Praman. Pratyaksha means, Aksha means your senses. Prati means direct. So Pratyaksha means your knowledge gained through direct perception, right? So what are the uh, senses that we use? To, we use our eyes, we use our ears to acquire knowledge, we use our sense of touch. Uh, we, you know, so we use all our senses, nose to smell, and, and so we gain knowledge through all our senses. Hmm? So, but but before this, what is the purpose of gaining knowledge in this world? If I may ask, why we want to acquire knowledge? Any ideas? Like, why we want to, why we have the desire to acquire knowledge in this world? Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely one of them. Just for the sake of knowledge, people want to acquire. Um, that's one, one reason. The other reason, for example, a room is dark. Will you enter that room? You will be scared uh, because there is the fear of unknown, right? When you have the light on, you have no, you have no exactly what you can get from the room where things are. But when room is dark, you would, there is a, uh, you know, fear of unknown, right? So for the sake of getting rid of the fear of unknown, you know, what's going on, suppose a disease comes, you want to know what, uh, when corona came, corona came, people were afraid because they don't know what that is and what uh, the implications of it. For example, stock market just crashed that day mm -hmm. uh, because people, fear of unknown, they don't know what, uh, what that meant. And uh, so, to address the fear of unknown, people like to acquire knowledge. Okay. Uh, so that's one reason people want to acquire knowledge. Uh, what other reasons? Uh, like just for the sake of gaining knowledge, people acquire knowledge. And the other reason is to reduce miseries in this world. For example, people were walking all the way in the past. Now they discovered an automobile or a four-wheeler. So that that reduces 
the pain of walking. To reduce miseries in this world, we acquire knowledge. And to increase comforts, also we acquire knowledge. For example, we have nice architecture where we live in better homes. We have the continuous water facilities, whatever facilities we have. Uh, so that is all through acquired knowledge in this world. So how to you know maneuver things in this world so that that can give you comforts in this world. So these are broadly four reasons to address the fear of unknown. We acquire knowledge in this world to increase the comforts, to reduce the pain in this world or to reduce miseries in this world or sometimes for the sake of knowledge. We want to gain for the sake of knowledge, right? So one time uh, Prabhupada, who was the, you know, founder Acharya of uh, you know the ISKCON movement when he was in the West. So he went to a you know, university where uh, a department where you know that's I think biology department. So so he read he you know he looked at two large volumes of books and they're all about you know how plants work or grass works. It's just a book on grass. So he asked him, why you know just to uh, why do you have to study about grass in you know such big volumes? He asked, and uh, you know the professor there he said, you know just for the sake of knowledge we want to understand you know how this uh, photosynthesis work or you know this plasma and all these things combined to make this grass life work. So we wanted to for just for the pure curiosity and sake of knowledge we you know we understand. Then Prabhupada asked, so. Uh, why do you, you know, spend so much energy in learning about grass? Why don't we inquire about the creator of grass? Right? So uh, you should also spend some time learning about the source of it. Right? So, so those are the broad reasons why people like to acquire knowledge. And the first means of acquiring knowledge is Pratyaksha Praman or direct perce sense perception. Hmm? So now the, the second one is now, the senses are used to acquire knowledge from this world. Uh, now, you can hypothesize from the knowledge that you acquired to propose some new theory, right? Suppose uh, there, is a, there is a room, right, from which there is sound coming. Eh? And one lady and one man were talking, right? They are maybe shouting at each other. So just by staying outside, you can guess or you can um, you can introspect and understand maybe this is because the wife and husband are talking to each other right or you know or maybe they are practicing some drama that could be another reason okay. so there are many um, ways you can speculate what could be the reason um, but then you open the door the fact could be that it might be just a television that is playing there right so fact could be very different than what you may conceive as the truth. Right? So this is what you acquire knowledge through the senses, but in your, so mind is like a coordinating sense. You use, it acquires knowledge from eyes, ears, nose, touch. So all these senses were used to acquire knowledge, mind processes, and it speculates or it proposes newer facts, right? Uh, uh, proposes new, newer extensions to the knowledge that was acquired through senses. So you may understand that maybe there is something going on between a wife and husband or a drama or something, right? Um, but the fact could be very different than that. So that is acquiring all the theories in this world. Uh, for example, um, how, how the theories get formed in this world. Uh, suppose, right, so you want to establish a theory that, you know, all crows are black, for example, right? So you, through your direct perception, you see in your own city that there are crows in the city of Seattle are black, right? Then you call your friend in Austin, inquire, hey, what are the color of crows in your city? He says, yes, they're all black. And somebody else from some other city you inquire. So now you have multiple facts from multiple cities, multiple countries. So now you propose a theory, all, so, so we have the data to back, you know, to say all the crows are back. We have the actual data to prove it uh, by statistics. And now say we, you are the authority in, you know, in the crows, right? And to say that crows are always black. And say down the time after five years, somebody says, uh, because you are the authority on crows, somebody discovered there is a white crow somewhere, you know, in Africa. 
So he would call you and tell you, hey, we discovered a white crow. <laughs> then now you need to extend your you know, existing theory or whatever to accommodate this new fact. So the science builds like that. So you have certain observations, you put them together and you propose a theory. The theory stands good until a new fact that defeats your you know, existing understanding. So the science grows like that, right? So now you have to change your fact saying crows are you know, primarily black, but sometimes they can be white. So that's your new theory. So, so that's why science has these additions. It's always you know, incremental. It's never, it's never perfect. It's always on the way to perfection. So that's that's the limitation of you know Prachaksha and Anuma. So they acquire knowledge, but they stand true only until a contradicting fact comes, mm -hmm. and knowledge has to be the new facts have to be accommodated with the existing understanding. So that's how knowledge always works. Shabda Praman. So we learn about this in future, but uh, Shabda Praman is if you want to know some facts, the best. For example, if you want to know who your father is, right? Uh, you can do, say, DNA test. But there is a limitation. How many people? So it's mentioned that it may take about 100 years to get uh, in this world if you have to find out who your father is through scientific research, through DNA uh, match. In a 100-year period of time, if you calculate, you know, reach out to all the people's DNA, you would come to about 200 people who could be one of your father based on A's and everything, right? So it's not practical to find through, but the easiest way to find who your father is, to ask your mother, right? So mother is the authority to tell who your father is. You can confirmly believe when mother says, he's my father, yeah? So Shabda Praman is like that. It's hearing from a bona fide authority, right? So Vedas are fall under that category where knowledge is already coming from a bona fide authority. Right? So, so we learn more about it. So let's, you know, we'll discuss these three topics with little more, you know, facts so that the conviction becomes very clear, right? So let's discuss Prachaksha Praman here. Yeah. The question is whether Prachaksha or Anuman, can they give us perfect knowledge? Right, so you see here, people say seeing is believing. Whatever I see, that's all I believe. Right, but here you see, um, you see parallel lines of the track, as if they are converging. But are they really converging? No. But I show as if they are converging. Right, but that's not the fact. You can see here the distorted reflection in a concave and a convex lens. The same person looks very different. What you say, if what you say is what you see is what you believe, then what you see here is not truth. Here, due to law of refraction, the pencil is shown as if it is broken in the middle. But so what we are seeing here is we cannot really trust what we see. Right? So here you see the mirage. It appears as if there is water on the on the tar road, but actually it's just a mirage. It's not, you know, water. So similarly, we just showed some examples of ice, how ice can defeat us. But many times all these senses are like that: sight, touch, hearing, all these can defeat us in the same way. So we cannot acquire complete perfect knowledge through our material senses. So why we cannot acquire? Because uh, there are four defects, right? So the senses are imperfect. The senses, the eyes, ears, through which we acquire knowledge, they're imperfect. For example, eyes can see only certain range. And from the examples that we saw till now, we cannot below our eyes. It may show as if, you know, uh, the fact is different than what we see, right? So imperfect senses, but when you acquire knowledge through these imperfect senses, the naturally you get illusioned, just like we saw the track there. It appeared as if it is converging, but it's not converging, right? 
So because you are basing knowledge on imperfect senses, there is tendency to get illusioned, right? Yeah. And if you get illusioned, naturally you commit mistakes, right? Uh, so because your, your knowledge is based on imperfect senses and you are extending that knowledge to come to wrong conclusions, you got illusioned. So naturally you commit mistakes. And then uh, naturally, you know, when you commit mistakes, you want to cover it up. So that is, you know, cheating tendency, right? So that all exists in every human being because we all have limited senses. So these facts, these four defects exist in any knowledge acquired in this existence. Yeah. Yeah. So some more examples here. Yeah. You see here, uh, the eye, human eye can see things between 400 millimicron to 700 millimicron. That's all the human range. So beyond that, there exists. So that's the visible light. Beyond light, beyond that, there is you know much larger spectrum of you know vision that we can't really see. So through our eyes, we cannot get the perfect knowledge, right? So we can't even see what is behind a wall, right? Because our eyes are limited in what we can see. Similarly, our ears also are very limited in what they can acquire. So. The hearing, hearing range is between 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz only. Hmm? So there is a you know uh, complete range outside of this, you know, infra infra sound and ultrasonic sound, um, which other animals can perceive, but we can't perceive. Hmm? Uh, so for example, uh, in the West, we use certain uh, you know audio devices that produce this, uh, this you know, ultrasound that can make, for example, rats to flee away, right? When you switch on that noise, it's like, you know, large alarm. We, we don't hear at all because that's beyond our hearing range. But rats, they just run, run away because they can't tolerate that sound. It's very uh, annoying sound. So, so our ears, we cannot rely on it to get perfect knowledge. Here you see, um, yeah, through experimentation also. So some may say, hey, through our microscope we can extend our, you know, you know, range. But still, there is a range even to that. Right? It's not perfect. Yeah. So this is the statement of Eugene Wigner. Um, how each senses, each of the senses can be imperfect. Yeah. And. So we heard about till uh, you know till now about ear and eye. Even tongue, tongue is another sense to acquire knowledge in this world, right? Suppose you have eaten a gulab jamun, right? Very sweet. Right after eating gulab jamun, if you eat an orange, it tastes sour, right? Um, but if you if you eat a little bit of lemon and then eat orange after that, it tastes sweet. Because the taste buds are relative in the, in you know in tasting a thing, right? So our we cannot. So then is orange sweet or sour, right? It depends on what your experience was before that. Yeah. So <clears throat> similarly, if uh, you know if you have a warm hand, if you touch uh, water, it appears cool. But if you have a cold hand, if you touch water, it appears hot, right? So that's our experience. Skin, same, similarly. So I'm just showing how each of the sense, you know, diff, you know, illusions us. Yeah. So here you can see some pictures. So what do you see here? A girl is there, yeah. Young girl, you can see her nose, hair, and chin, right? You can see that. But is there anything else also? You see that that there is an old lady. The whole white thing is her, you know, hair, cloth on the hair. You see that? And her nose is... So this is her nose. Sorry. You see the nose here? This is the mouth and this is the chin. You see the old lady there? So... Each of us can see 
and get different understanding based on what we see. So this is how our eyes can illusion us. Do you see what here? A pi and also what? A triangle. It it's it appears as if it is there, but it's not there actually. <laughs> yeah. What do you see here? Old couple. Yeah, and then two musicians are also there. Yeah. Yeah. You see, if you see steadily at some center point, it appears as if those are cylinders standing, moving circularly. Correct? But actually, it's a static picture. Right? So you can see how our eyes illusion us. Look at the center. You see the, you know, the circles moving. See the center dot and move your head, you know, front and black. You can see as if the circles are, you know, turning around. Yeah. So all our senses can get, have the tendency to be illusion. We have seen how our tongue, our ears, our eyes, everything can get illusioned. So we cannot acquire perfect knowledge with imperfect senses. If you have imperfect tool in your hand, how can you get perfect work done, right? Yeah. So our tools are imperfect. Yeah. Even, you know, <clears throat> in the past, you know, as our understanding of, you know, our bodily parts has been growing, but in the beginning, when the, you know, the brain was studied, initially they thought it's a device to just cool and heat the body with blood. Yeah, yeah please sit. So, so brain was thought to be a device to cool your, you know, body temperature, but it's, you know, it's proven to be wrong later on, right? Yeah. And uh, initial research, you know, medical research thought that pituitary or master gland is, you know, is a useless part in the body, right? But actually later on, we know how critical it is uh, for many bodily functions, right? So these are various ways how, if you acquire knowledge through your, you know, direct senses, you get illusioned. And you commit mistakes like this. You get to wrong conclusions and wrong understanding. Hmm? Okay. Yeah, right? Yeah. So, so the Hubble constant that, you know, that is helpful in measuring the distances between objects, especially cosmic objects. The Hubble constant is a constant, right? The name itself says constant, but it has changed over a period of time, the constant. So it has changed three times at least so far. So it's a, it became a Hubble variable, right? Um, yeah. So after Darwin's, you know, evolution theory came, there are many scientists who try to prove, hey, Darwin's theory is correct. So, um, so there, you know, there were a lot of these artifacts that were found from fossil fuels which were, you know, they would stand for say 30, 40 years. Later on, it's proved to be, a, you know, uh, it's actually not a real proof. It means it's it's a, you know, it's a cheating, you know, that they have conducted, right? So, so many of these were proven wrong. Like they, they, they bring certain artifact as if, you know, it's an evolution in between human and ape, right? So they propose these uh, artifacts as if they are coming and then, Eventually, they are all proven to be wrong. Most, all, right? Right, yeah, that's a speculation that nobody had seen. Uh, but to prove that over a period of time, you know, a lot of people have shown some artifacts as if they are, you know, as part of the evolution. Mm -hmm. But a lot of them could not stand the, you know, test of time. I'll show you a video that actually yeah, uh, I don't have the video. Yeah. 
Evolutionists go so far in this subject that they can even invent very different faces for the same skull. The three entirely different reconstructions made for the fossil calls in Xanthropus is a famous example showing how persistent evolutionists are in producing these false masks. Another intermediate transitional form fabricated by evolutionists was the Nebraska man. This was cooked up in 1922 on the basis of a single fossil tooth. The evolutionists did not neglect to give it an ostentatious Latin name, Asparopithecus Harold Cooka, or to make imaginary drawings related to it. It was soon revealed that the tooth that had been the source of inspiration for Nebraska man in fact belonged to a wild pig. Many other fossil skulls have been presented as great evidence for evolution failed one by one. Neanderthal man was advanced as evidence in 1856, dismissed in 1960. Piltdown man was advanced as evidence in 1912, dismissed in 1953. Zenzanthropus was advanced as evidence in 1959, dismissed in 1960. Ramapithecus was advanced as evidence in 1964, dismissed in 1979. So the reason to show is, you know, when we acquire knowledge through imperfect senses, the knowledge need not be perfect. Okay, it will not be perfect, right? So we can we have seen, you know, real evidence for that here, right? So the real question is, how do we acquire perfect knowledge? That's where we are heading towards. Um, so we saw prachaksha praman, which is direct perception, and how that could lead us to, you know, incorrect conclusions. Now. Anuman Praman, we acquire knowledge in this world through the senses. And on, so when mind is like a coordinating sense, it acquires this knowledge and proposes new theories, right? So that's what we discussed a little while ago. So that is called Anuman Praman, right? It's basically um, observations and then coming to newer conclusions or inferences. So we'll see Anuman Praman a little more how it cannot be perfect, right? Yeah, so this is, uh, yeah. So this is a statement of Darwin, right? I'm a firm believer that without speculation, there is no good and original observation. After five years of work, I allowed myself to speculate on the subject and drew up some short notes. These I enlarged in 1844 into a sketch of the conclusion, which seemed to me probable. So it's, this is a statement of Darwin. So he made some observations and he put forward his theory of, uh, you know, the theory of evolution, original species, right? <clears throat> so we can see, like, you know, some of the evidences that came to prove Darwin's theory, how they failed, right? It's a pure, you know, speculative theory, right? Yeah, so this is... Yeah, so, um, but later on, there are proofs to show that men as well as apes are the so-called the evolutionary thing have existed together millions of years ago, right? Uh, so that really proves to be wrong theory, right? Yeah, so, you know, this is a funny statement from Darwin. So he said, a bear can evolve into a, uh, you know, whale. <laughs> so you can read, right? In North America, the black bear was seen swimming for hours with wide open mouth, thus catching like a, you know, like a whale, insects in water. Uh, even in so extreme a case as this, if the supply of insects were constant and if better uh, adapted competitors did not already exist in the country, I can see no difficulty in a race of bears by natural selection, more and more aquatic in their structure and habits with larger and larger mouths uh, 
till a creature was produced as monstrous as a whale. So you can, <laughs> but later on it's proven like, you know, the genetics of these two animals are so different. They cannot be ever same. Uh, so this is the kind of, uh, you know, theory that we have studied in our books. Yeah. Yeah. Again, we all have studied this giraffe extending her head, right? And uh, trying to acquire and by through natural selection, how giraffes with long heads have survived, right? This is another speculation. So one person asked, hey, why should the giraffe should stand and, you know, eat the leaves? Why can't it, it eat the grass on the <laughs> ground, right? So there is no, you know, it's just a speculation. All this is just pure speculation. There is no proof, right, for any of this. Yeah, so the, so it, why why not, why only giraffe? Why not other, you know, other animals have extended their head? There are so many questions on this kind of theories. So these are all pure speculations. Yeah, so now we'll discuss some problems that occur because of wrong speculative theories like this or wrong inferences, right? Yeah. So one may say, hey, the all this research, this is good because it is giving some comforts. It's giving, you know, reducing my misery. Yeah, all those parts are good. But it can also, it, it's not perfect. That's what we are trying to come to, right? Uh, the understanding we are trying to acquire to is... Uh, the knowledge that is acquired through direct sense perception or through you know through inquiry uh, these means they give knowledge but they are not perfect knowledge yeah so the real goal is to how to acquire real perfect knowledge right so we know research has brought so many new gadgets to our uh, you know for people right but we also know now how many negative effects of those gadgets are right now, right? So people are addicted to it and they become very unsocial, right? Yeah. So we know about, you know, Theranos lab. The, you know, false promises in science. Right? So there was a um, few, I think, a couple of centuries ago, uh, there was this very famous bubonic plague, which, you know, uh, <clears throat> which caused uh, uh, rampant death because the plague, so that time, the you know, the researchers understood that this bubonic plague was caused by the prolif proliferation of cats. That's what they thought. So there was a big endeavor to, you know, eliminate all the cats in existence. But later on, it was found that the actual bubonic plague was caused by rats. Now, by the time they <laughs> eliminated, by the time, you know, the rats are increasing, the cats were eliminated. So the disease became multifold, right? So wrong conclusions can lead to such disasters. Yeah. So half knowledge is very dangerous. Yeah. Many times solution, the so-called solution to a problem can be a bigger problem. Right? So in the um, <clears throat> so in the past people were depending on you know, many things made of wood. Right? Um like chairs or anything, right? Uh, but later on, they realized, you know, this wood is called, cutting wood is causing a lot of deforestation. Let's uh, depend on something else. So they, you know, started rampant use of plastic as a replacement for wood, right? The buckets and all these things were now made of uh, plastic. But what happened? That increased pollution now, right? So the, the original goal is to address a, a temporary problem, but that led to a bigger problem later on, right? So use of plastic was a bigger problem now, right? So similarly, people were using horses for, you know, moving around in the past, like say 100 years ago. But then there was 
now you know discovery of automobile and you know planes etc so now commute is much better but at the same time there are much more road accidents and pollution bigger problem right so the problems that we try to address through modern research and you know advancement many times there are good benefits but the many times they led to a bigger problem than the original problem itself. You see? Uh, so we have a lot of such examples here. So here is a you know sample of a person who is trying to speculate on how a device can be used by without really using a manual. Yeah. So in this world also, we try to, you know, many times we try to use our own intelligence to operate things. And that may not work out to be the best, right? So we'll see how, you know, this person is trying to discover a, you know. <laughs> yeah. So sometimes when we try to figure out without taking, you know, we can make our life more complicated. That's the lesson. Yeah. So real happiness comes from perfect knowledge. Now, so where is the manual that gives this perfect understanding of everything around us, right? Now that leads to key, you know, that, that gives uh, the real key to happiness. Yeah. Now, we will, yeah. You can read this, right? So, <clears throat> so the person is asking, how do we acquire knowledge? We, we discussed that, you know, we have these four defects because of which you know we cannot acquire perfect knowledge through our senses nor can we use these senses and speculate further from you know because that's an extension to our senses only so it cannot even give perfect knowledge how do we acquire perfect knowledge in this world right so what is the other way around is there any other way so that is called shabda praman or hearing from a bona fide authority So in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says in fourth chapter, evam parampara praptam imam raja shayo vidu. Hmm? So this knowledge was acquired, the knowledge that Krishna gave to Arjuna. Hmm? This is this is not you know something that I am giving you right now. This knowledge is given in a parampara system for a long time ago. It's not just you know this knowledge is not new. The knowledge that Krishna gave to Arjuna in Bhagavad Gita is not anything that's you know manufactured right there. It's an eternal knowledge, with eternal wisdom that was coming from a long, long time ago. In fact, that same knowledge Krishna gave to you know Vivaswan, the sun god, millions of years ago. Hmm? Yeah. So hearing from bona fide authority. So that is the third praman or shabda praman. Just like we discussed in the beginning of the session, if you want to know who your father is, it's one way is to do, you know, do a DNA research on finding who that man can be. The other way is just go to your mom and ask who, may, who is my father, right? That's the easiest way. So similarly, Vedic wisdom is like 
a mother for us right so when so it the knowledge there you know is perfect wisdom so we have seen you know a lot of examples in the second slide right how vedic truths have stood the test of time right so vedic aphorisms they're like you know how we discussed about how cow dung is pure huh? or embryology all these are wisdom that is already given in vedic texts and there is no research or anything done but because the origin of the so knowledge is perfect we just have to accept and that that is perfect knowledge in fact all the vedic truths through scientific experimentation can be proven not everything but whatever physically possible can be proven right so that's how jagadish chandra bose proved that plants have life right he has taken a vedic truth and through experimentation he proved that its plants have truly life right so we can do research and prove a lot of these you know vedic facts yeah so this we discussed right so you can do medical procedure but you can't really perfect right the other perfect method is to inquire from your mother so it's called deductive knowledge so the other method is called inductive knowledge where you acquire from other sources deductive knowledge is there is a higher source of truth you just acquire by you know uh, faithfully hearing the vedas however are not as well known for presenting historical and scientific knowledge as they are for expounding subtle sciences such as the power of mantras we all recognize the power of sound itself by its effects which can be quite dramatic here a high pitched frequency shatters a drinking glass so we can easily understand that loud sounds can produce substantial reactions it is commonly believed that mantras can carry hidden power which can in turn produce profound effects the ancient vedic literatures are full of descriptions of weapons being called by mantra for example many weapons were invoked by mantra during the epic kurukshetra war were in the bhagavad gita itself was spoken the ancient deployment of brahmastra weapons equivalent to modern day nuclear weapons are described throughout the vedic literatures additionally mantras carry hidden spiritual power which can produce significant benefits when chanted properly indeed the vedas themselves are sound vibrations in literary form and carry a profound message yeah. the vedas are like a mother right mother always you know wishes the best she always whatever she informs us is in our best interest god is like the father and vedic wisdom gives knowledge of god right? not just wisdom of this world yeah just like you know uh, in this world when we want to acquire knowledge we go to authorized universities or you know well established universities we, we don't go to any random place to learn right because we the source of knowledge we want to make sure it's bona fide right so similarly if you want to acquire vedic knowledge so what are the authoritative sources right so this like in the verse that we discussed little while ago so that can be acquired through a parampara system there are well known vedic paramparas uh, because the source of all these paramparas are you know perfect source because the source is perfect the line of you know the teachers coming in that line would transmit the knowledge without any adulteration so as long as there is no adulteration the the knowledge is as good as hearing directly from the source right so um, hearing in a parampara is going to give us perfect knowledge if one may say hey, i don't have the opportunity to hear bhagavad gita directly from lord krishna 
does it mean that we don't have the opportunity to acquire same realization as Arjuna? No, because there are paramparas starting from Lord Krishna. And in that line of teachers, the message was transmitted as, as it is. Right? If we have a parampara, if we learn from a teacher coming in that parampara, who is directly in that line is connected to Lord Krishna. And if the message was transmitted unadulterated, then you actually get the same benefit that Arjuna got when he acquired that knowledge. Right? So like that. Yeah. So similar to authorized college, there is parampara. Uh, similar to how a professor's, you know, uh, help in an authorized college, there are spiritual masters or gurus in an authorized parampara, bona fide parampara. Hmm? And there are the professors use books, like for example, for electricity uh, to learn about electricity, there is a Bill Theresa's textbook, right? So similarly, there are Vedic texts, which are, uh, you know, the authority to texts that where we can learn this Vedic wisdom, right? So if you learn this science, Vedic wisdom, in a bona fide sampradaya, from a bona fide teacher, from using the sources, bona fide sources like Vedic texts, like Bhagavad Gita, then you actually acquire true Vedic wisdom. Hmm? Yeah. So this is, you know, the, the advanced sciences is also there in, you know, in the Vedic books like Vima and Shastra. I'll not, I'll skip this one. University of California at Irvine, April 2017. I'll skip this one. The aerospace engineer. So basically, we proved that you know some aerodynamic properties exist. You know that were given in Vedic texts, where he was able to prove in a lab that it works. In the interest of time, I'll just skip. What is this? Yeah. Yeah. So, and Vedic knowledge also has perfect predictions, right? For example, Gautam Buddha's birth was predicted in Srimad Bhagavatam. You can see here the verses say, Buddha will come and his, you know, mother and father and so and so. And, you know, he's going to, you know, propound this specific wisdom like that. Chanikya Pandita was also predicted in Bhagavatam. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was predicted in Mahabharat. Right? Emperor Ashoka in Bhagavatam. There are specific verses that you know speak about these. The Vedas are amongst the oldest religious scriptures known to mankind and are the source of India's spiritual and cultural heritage. At first glance, the multifaceted culture of the Vedas is a foreign and fascinating mystery to the Western eye. Yet upon deeper examination, we discover a wealth of philosophical, cultural, and social values. India is renowned the world over for the practice of yoga, which increases one's mental and physical strength. However, this is only a fraction of what the Vedas can offer to a progressive global community. India's culinary arts, music, natural medicine, and other sciences are only now becoming known to the West. Conceivably the world's oldest holistic design system, the Vastu Shastra predates and inspired the popular Chinese system of Feng Shui. The design of a temple, house, or workspace has been proven to exert a considerable influence on one's well-being. The Vastu Shastra was compiled specifically to address this concern and offers practical architectural guidelines. This style of sacred architecture has been implemented in the building of India's largest temples for thousands of years. The sculptures adorning these temples reflect the development and accomplishments of one of man's oldest civilizations. They depict the struggles, failures, and successes of the men who made them 
the center of their lives. Sophisticated Vedic sciences of astrology, astronomy, cosmology, and metaphysics profoundly influenced the Greeks, Babylonians, and even contemporary scientists with their unparalleled knowledge. Ancient Vedic sages presented precise calculations a millennium before Copernicus, Galileo, Newton, and Einstein. Yeah. So now we'll discuss briefly about how, you know, all of us, specifically Indians, were, you know, diverted from our faith in our scriptures, you know, some, because it was done with some intention. Early Indologists wish to control and convert the followers of Vedic culture. Therefore, they widely propagated that the Vedas were simply mythology. So, once again, just to give you an introduction. So, these Indologists were, you know, people coming from Western world, specifically British. So, when they came, when they want to exert their power over our country, first they needed to prove that they have something superior to offer. To do that, they need to introduce their culture, their habits and everything, right? So to show that, to prove, because people are already satisfied here. People are, you know, happy and satisfied. So they need to prove that what we have is inferior to what they can offer, right? So they had to interpret certain things in certain ways so that they can appear and fool us that what we have is lower than what they can offer, right? So so Max Muller and these, you know, some of these uh, Indologists were specifically appointed. These are actually all intellectuals from the West. They all were appointed to actually, you know, inferiorize our culture. Max Muller, perhaps the most well-known early Sanskritist and Indologist, although later in life he glorified the Vedas, initially wrote that the Vedas were worse than savage and India must be conquered again by education. Its religion is doomed. Thomas Macaulay, who introduced English education into India, wanted to make the residents into a race that was Indian in blood and color, but English in taste in opinion, in morals, and in intellect. However, the German philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer stated that the Sanskrit understanding of these Indologists was like that of young schoolboys. These early Indologists devised the Aryan invasion theory, denying India's Vedic past. They taught that the English educational system is superior. They intentionally misinterpreted Sanskrit texts to make the Vedas look primitive. And they systematically tried to make Indians ashamed of their own culture. Thus, the actions of these Indologists seems to indicate that they were motivated by a racial bias. Yeah, can see. Yeah, you can see now a statement by Tulsi Gabbard. She's a U.S. congressman in the past. No, I think she's... Aloha and namaste. 2020 is certainly a year that will not soon be forgotten. For most, if not all of us, it has brought about many unexpected changes. The uncertainty that this year has brought has made me personally reflect upon the time that I spent deployed in the Middle East. That too was a time in my life when there was danger at every step. Each day brought new uncertainties and likewise, many lives were lost. My shelter then and now has been the Bhagavad Gita, which means song of God. The Bhagavad Gita spoken by Sri Krishna is full of transcendental wisdom that is as relevant today as it was 5,000 years ago when it was spoken. 
when we are blown here and there by the strong winds of change, when giant waves are crashing upon us, when we're feeling unsteady, lost, adrift, the Bhagavad Gita offers us guidance and hope. Looking at our problems through the prism of eternality, rather than merely identifying with our temporary material circumstances, gives us an anchor that offers great peace, purpose, and stability through even the most trying of times. May we always be blessed with remembrance of Sri Krishna, his unconditional love, and his transcendental appearance in this world. Jaya Sri Krishna. Even in modern science, we accept many things as facts called axioms, right? So why can't we so why can't we accept the same thing with Vedic truths as well, right? Because that enables us to further advance. Later on, you may, you know, have the opportunity to experiment on it. For example, you have studied electron, right? You haven't seen when you studied in your school or college. But maybe, you know, when you get to a stage where you are doing PhD, that time you may get the apparatus to actually really test the existence of electron. But you initially started with some faith, right? So we all start in life with some faith, even to advance in science. So even um, today, you may not experience the soul. That's also a fact that, you know, like an axiom in the Vedic texts. But over a period of time, if we practice what is given there, you know, in the Vedic texts like Bhagavad Gita, the practice of yoga, we'll also get to a place where through experience, we actually, you know, learn that the soul really exists through our own personal experience and realization. So there are many laws like law, thermodynamics, Heisenberg, uncertainty principle that wouldn't let us, you know, Yeah, so these are the four uh, institutes from where we can acquire perfect knowledge, just like we discussed, uh, you know, in the modern world, there is these universities where we acquire knowledge, right, the well-established universities. So similarly, there are four, you know, sampradayas coming from, you know, the highest authorities, like Lakshmi, Sri Sampradaya. There is one source that Brahmaji, Lord Brahma, there is one sourced at Rudra, and there are there is one sourced by four Kumaras. So these are the four bona fide sampradayas where we can learn this Vedic wisdom perfectly. So the modern day acharyas of Sri Sampradaya is Ramanujacharya. You must have heard in South India, especially in Tamil Nadu, there is a lot of temples there. And there is Madhvacharya, who is a modern day Acharya from Brahma Sampradaya. He he was from you know Karnataka. And there is Vishnu Swami in Rudra Sampradaya, is in the northern side. And in the four Kumaras, there is Nimbarka Swami. So these are the modern day saints. Just like well known scientists, these are saints in these paramparas, right? whom we can follow. So this is, the, the Vedic knowledge was revealed by supreme person within the heart of the first created being, Brahma. So this is the source of Vedic wisdom. So the source, so what is the source of Vedic knowledge? Is it also some speculation by some great sages? We may think like that, or you know, uh, we may consider like that. But actually Vedic knowledge has a perfect source that because the source is God himself. So it's a, it's a revealed knowledge. It's a it's a realized knowledge. It's not experimental knowledge. Right? So in general, in this world, the knowledge is acquired through experimentation and speculation. But this knowledge is revealed in those great you know, people who can more qualified to acquire that knowledge. So in the beginning, uh, this is the first, very first sloka in Srimad Bhagavatam. So where it says, this Vedic knowledge, this original knowledge, because Brahma was considered as the first created being in this existence. 
So in his heart, this knowledge was revealed, this Vedic wisdom of existence. Yeah. So from, we can see how this knowledge has come from in this parampara, right? Everything is sourced in Krishna and then Brahma, from there Narada and then many Acharyas in the line. So, so in this line, you can see Prabhupada, who is a recent teacher, right? So he he just lived about you know fifty years ago. So it comes to discipline We haven't got to manufacture something. Uh, we simply repeat the words and the instruction given by the religious. Krishna instructed Brahma. Brahma instructed Narad. Narad instructed Vyasdev. Vyasdev instructed Madhyacharya. And in this way, then Madhavendra Puri, Ishwar Puri, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, then the six Goswamis, then uh, the Srinivas Acharya, Kaviraj Goswami, Narutam Das Thakur, Vishwanath Chakravarti, Jagannath Das Bhavaji, Bhakti Vinath Thakur, Gaur Kishat Das Bhavaji, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, and then we are doing the same thing. There is no difference. That is the specific procedure of the Krishna consciousness movement. Krishna conscious movement is not a modern day you know, creation. It has you know, roots directly from Lord Krishna himself. Yeah. Yeah, you can see here. About 5,000 years ago, Vyasadeva, he is considered literary incarnation. He put these Vedas in writing for the first time. And why he has written? Because he knew uh, that people of Kaliuga, the forthcoming generations, were you know not qualified to just hear in oral reception and you know be able to remember and you know practice in their life. So he had to put that in writing. So for the first time, it was in a written form for the benefit of Kaliuga people. So those are those Vedic texts. All these sources sources mostly in Vyasade. All the Vedas, Puranas. You can see you know, the chart here. Primarily Vedic wisdom was classified as Shruti and Smriti. Shruti is what is revealed absolute truth. Smriti is what is remembered. And again under Shruti there is Veda, Upaveda, Vedang and under Smriti again Pancharatra, Purana, all these things come. Itihasas. Uh, so in this way the whole knowledge was divided. Hmm? Yeah. So of course we may wonder, oh, Vedic knowledge is so vast. How, how do I, you know, how do I acquire the knowledge? My lifetime is so short. Can I even have time? You know, where do I, how do I, what's the means for me? Right? The good thing is all this knowledge, the essence of all the Vedic wisdom is captured in one small book. What is that? Bhagavad Gita. Yeah. Bhagavad Gita is, suppose if, this all this Vedic wisdom is like a cow's body. What is the essence of cow? Milk. So that milk is Bhagavad Gita. And uh, who is the coward? Who is actually milking the cow? Lord Krishna. And Pard or Arjuna is the is like a vatsa or the baby cow that is drinking from the udder from the cow. So that Vedic wisdom, the essence of all the Vedic wisdom was churned by Lord Krishna from the mother cow and being fed to Arjuna directly. So Vedic wisdom is summarized in Bhagavad Gita. By studying Gita, we acquire you know, the essence of all the Vedic truths. There is Atheist Kapila. Yeah. So there are, you know, there is one Kapila Muni, as described in third canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, where Kapila teaches many things actually, including embryology was given by him. Uh, but there is also another atheist Kapila, 
Ledrum, uh, who actually propounded, you know, the atheistic philosophy. Uh, yeah, the, it's called Sankhya. It's a Sankhya. It's Sankhya. Yeah, but the original Sankhya was given by theist Kapila. Yeah, he is actually incarnation of you know God. Because he propounded um, atheism through his Sankhya philosophy. He only considered all the 24 material elements as source of everything. He didn't consider the 25th, which is the soul, and you know, 26, which is the you know pra, uh, uh, the super soul. Yeah. So he Brahman he ignored those concepts. So he based everything as sourced in the 24 material elements. Yeah, that is, you know, we're not going in depth. Um, yeah, so there is... Uh, huh? I read and I asked. Okay, yeah. So this, this is called Shad Darshans. Um, darshan means how do you, you know interpret the philosophy. So there is this Vedic wisdom. There are these great Acharyas. Um, by the name, you know, Vyasa, who gave the final, you know, theology of uh, Upanishads. But there are others like Jaimini, Gautama, Kanada, Patanjali, who gave various interpretations to the Vedic texts. But they're all, you know, again, like one-sided truth. They're not perfect. But what Vyasa was, gave was the conclusive truth. Yeah. So whatever we teach, you know, uh, within our classes, they're all primarily based on Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. He's the Acharya who comes in that line of teachers, starting from Lord Krishna. Right? Um, how do we acquire an apple in its true form from the tree? Suppose there is a line of people who can hand over one to each other. Eh? Uh, you can acquire the apple in its true form. But if it is thrown, it may fall on the floor and you may not get the, you know, in the right form, right? So Guru Parampara is like that. The apple is far away, but it is handed over through a line of teachers, right? So now you get the same knowledge. You get the same transformation that Arjuna got through, you know, directly hearing from Krishna. So for us, it is Prabhupada books that we base all our discussions on. Yeah. Now, we have discussed in the beginning the six blind men who were trying to, you know, speculate on what that object that they're touching or, you know, experiencing, right? They all had partial truth or partial understanding of the truth, right? But a wise man, a pandita, who can actually see what that object is, he can clearly tell what that is. So he has full truth. He can reveal the full truth because he is able to see it. But blind men were able to experience only partial truth because of what they could experience. So if we acquire, if we use only our senses to acquire everything knowledge in this world, our knowledge is always defective, impartial, or imperfect. But if we can acquire knowledge from a perfect source, then it is perfect. So that, that's the conclusive truth, actually. So we discussed about three ways of acquiring knowledge. Prachaksha, which is direct perception. Anumana, which is an extension to direct perception. And then Shabda, which is perfect you know, understanding, hearing from a bona fide authority. The Prachaksha Praman has four defects. right? Imperfect, because they are all sourced in imperfect senses. Therefore, you get illusioned. Because you get illusioned, you commit mistakes because you are trying to use imperfect senses to acquire knowledge in this world. And therefore, to cover your mistakes, you will also uh, you know, have cheating tendency. So, so we have seen some mistakes in, in disasters. And, huh? To cover your mistakes? Yeah, you cheat. Right? Yeah, Shabda Praman is perfect knowledge. Right? This is a summary chart. Huh? Yeah. So we discussed some Vedic truths and predictions. 
the four sampradayas and the branches of Vedas. Briefly. Yes, that is the summary of you know, uh, the topic for today. So we'll continue our discussion next week. There are about five people online. Any questions, anyone, on what we discussed? It's very clear. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Any questions online? Divya, Nirupama, Surabhid, Uma, if you have any questions, please let me know. Otherwise, actually, we have very short time. We need to close this wrap up. Uh, we'll end the class here then. Okay. Yeah. Thank you all very much for joining. Thank you, Prabhuji. Thank, thank you. you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you all for joining online. If you can come in person, that will even be great. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Prabhuji. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.